Katie. Hey, Julia. What's going on? Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. Love's in the air. There is lots of love in the air today. Lots of love. What, um, What are you doing on this lovely Valentine's Day besides hanging out with me? That is what I'm doing on this lovely Valentine's Day is hanging out with you. You are my Valentine's date that, this year. That's a great answer. You're also my <laughs> Valentine's date this year. I'm sorry I didn't buy you chocolates. I feel really bad. <laughs> I didn't buy you chocolates either, so, you know. We're the best Valentine's Day dates then. It, you, I, I don't need to buy you chocolate because you're already the sweetest. Katie! <laughs> <laughs> well... Well, I don't need any coffee because you're already my cup of tea. Oh, look at that. Just a couple of good old puns to get us started off here this morning. <laughs> um, okay, perfect. So um, why don't we start off with our trivia for for yeah, this episode, Julia? Trivia. So why don't you go ahead and go first? Um, because I went first last time. Um, during which show did Julia have her first stage kiss? A, Beauty and the Beast. B, Romeo and Juliet, or C, Thoroughly Modern Millie? Um, well, I know you didn't do it during Romeo and Juliet because we were in college when you did Romeo and Juliet. Um, mm-hmm. So I know it's not that. <laughs> um, I am going to guess Beauty and the Beast. You are correct. No way, really? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. Yeah, that was my first. That was my first stage kiss, and it was wildly uncomfortable. I threw all? in early modern Millie there as a red herring because my first real kiss happened during that oh, show. Oh, okay, okay, that's tricky. <laughs> and who were you in thoroughly modern Millie? I was Miss Dorothy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> mm, yes, <laughs> that feels right. <laughs> why because i'm a soprano (laughs) just feels good but yeah but it was beauty and the beast it was actually the first kiss we did was with gaston because she kisses both gaston Mm -hmm. and the beast in that show oh very nice Um, and like i said wildly uncomfortable (laughs) every every stage kisses (laughs) it always is it was one of those things where we would have i didn't know they existed at the time but it would have been beneficial to have an intimacy director there yeah intimacy directors Um, uh, are so important they are so important um and luckily for romeo and juliet i did have an intimacy director. that's great that's great and it was a far better experience good (laughs) because i had a (laughs) very good intimacy director that's great. So, okay, hit me with your question. All right, let's see. Well, my question here is um, Two Truths and a Lie, a stage romance Ooh. edition. Groovy. So, oh, groovy. So, um, here are your options. Option number one My first stage kiss was to a man twice my age. Stage number two <laughs> I once had a stage partner who ate McDonald's before our love scene every night. <laughs> every night and three one time my stage partner forgot about our kiss and exited before the scene was over in front of an audience while i was quite literally left there rejected oh wow (laughs) (laughs) this is really hard katie (laughs) because dear audience i do not exaggerate when i say many strange things have happened to katie on stage katie has some stories yeah um I'm going to say that the first one is true. Okay. Because I believe you've told me this story before about Lend Me a Tenor. Okay. True and terrifying. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to say that the second one is a lie. I regret to inform you that your decision is not correct. Um, Actually, number three was a lie. Uh, that my stage partner forgot about our kiss and exited before the scene was over. That did ne- that never happened to me. Um, did it happen to someone you know? Because that's so specific. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it did happen when I did High School Musical. <laughs> um, <laughs> when I did High School Musical, there was a scene. It wasn't a kiss, but it was just a really awkward scene where Troy Bolton was supposed to enter and it just never happened. <laughs> And and <laughs> nobody could do anything because the entire scene was about, like, basketball and, like, Troy. And so it was, like, 
Sharpay, which was me. And if you know me at all, you know that that's just not <laughs> the role for me. But really? I, I thought Sharpay was your type <laughs> to a t- <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely not my type. But um, <laughs> yeah, it was like me, Ryan, and, and, and Gabriella on stage just kind of standing there like, Really, it it went on for about three minutes until he finally came on stage. So it was very awkward. Um, but no, that did not happen to anybody that I know. Katie, I have a brand new obsession. Does it involve music and candles? You know it. Then it's got to be sense memory. Their soy vegan candles are natural, good for the planet, and 100% homemade. These candles make the perfect gift for friends and family because not only do they have these fun themes, but each candle also comes with a corresponding, personally curated Spotify playlist to set the mood. My best friend is the biggest T-Swift fan in the world, and she absolutely loved the Folklore Evermore and Cottagecore candle I gave her this Christmas. I tried out the Cocoa Butter Bitch candle, and let me tell you, Katie, I felt like a classy lady. If that isn't enough to win you over, shipping is covered in the price of the candle. Yeah, I'll say that again. Shipping is covered in the price of the candle so that you can say goodbye to all these hidden fees and say hello to supporting small business owners. Not to mention that every time you purchase a candle with Sense Memory, you are directly supporting an arts organization. To find your perfect candle, visit caitlincrawl.com slash sensememory or follow them at sense.memory on Instagram. That's at S-C-E-N-T-S dot memory on Instagram. Okay, awesome. Well, Julia, do you want to tell our listeners a little bit about Stage Kiss, what the play is about? Yes, indeed. So this synopsis for this week is from theatermania.com. Ooh, love. An unnamed heroine returns to the theater after many years of raising a family. A long-forgotten, frothy musical comedy from the 1930s forces her to choose between a husband and a former lover. Mm. Reality and fantasy crash as she finds herself stuck between her own husband and her co-star. An actor she loved and left many years ago. The stage kisses become more passionate between the two actors as they rekindle their past flame. Ooh. So, do you want to tell us a little bit about Sarah Rule? I would love to. Um, all of this info about Sarah Rule was taken from the direct Sarah Rule website. Um... Perfect. So uh, Sarah Rule's originally from Chicago. Very, very good. Some of her most famous plays include In the Room Next Door or The Vibrator Play, which Julie and I were just talking about a couple days ago. Uh, the Passion Play, <laughs> The Melancholy Play, Eurydice, Dead Man's Cell Phone, tons of others. Very, very, very famous playwright with some very famous names under her belt um, of plays that she's written. But she, I, this I didn't know, and I put in my notes, just what in parentheses, I had no <laughs> idea, but she studied with Paula Vogel at Brown university to get her MFA. Oh, which is just dope. If you don't know who's, who Paula Vogel is, she's another uh, just incredible playwright. Um, go look her, go up. look her <laughs> up, which is just crazy. Um, but Sarah Rule ended up, uh, working as, on the executive council for the dramatist guild for three years, um, and actually currently works at the Yale S- School of Drama. Um, and she's won tons and tons of awards, the Steinberg Distinguished Playwright Award, the Feminist Award, uh, Feminist Press 40 Under 40 Award, the Lilly Award. I mean, just all all over the place with these awards that she's won. So she's a pretty, uh, she knows what she's doing. <laughs> Sarah Rule knows That's what she's queen. doing. Go off, queen. I love. So with that, I love, I love. Julie, I would love to know what experience you have um, with this play. I saw this play for the first time when I was 16. And it was, I, I was doing a show at the Cider Mill Playhouse at the time. And it was in the same season as that show. And my family had bought comp ticket, or not comp tickets, they had bought um, season tickets to see the entire season of shows. So we went, I saw the show with my parents. Very nice. <laughs> what a play to see with your parents. Fun. 
<laughs> what a fun one to see with my parents. <laughs> and it was really good. I I remember it being really good. Um, everyone in it was really good. Then I kind of forgot about it for a year. And then when we were freshmen, I needed a monologue for, for freshman year Jerry's. So I was like, oh, I need to look for like something that's a little because everyone everyone if you are a female and you are in a bfa program everyone's doing Teresa Rebeck and everyone brings in the same four monologues by Teresa Rebeck i did my first freshman monologue by Teresa Rebeck <laughs> yes I, I and i literally like i brought in like three of them to our professor and she was like no 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 and i was like okay and so i i was like oh stage kids had a monologue for a girl it was like a little kind of neurotic, like type A. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. I'll do that. <laughs> so I bought the play and I found the monologue because it like I couldn't I couldn't find the monologue anywhere online. Mm. Um, so I bought the play, found the monologue, and then I gave it to our professor and she was like, "Perfect, do this." <laughs> and I did it at nauseum. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you did a great job with it, though. Oh, well, thank You're you. You're welcome. It's a fun monologue. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Actually, as I was reading the play, I was like, Katie would just kill this part. (laughs) (laughs) Specifically in the line where she was like, I'm 23, but I always have to play 16-year-olds. It's so annoying. (laughs) Is that a short joke, Julia? Are you saying that because I'm short? (laughs) No, I just, I can see you saying that line. Yeah. It would be hilarious. (laughs) For sure. For sure. That, that, That whole show is filled, it's filled with some really good female roles. I mean, there's not many in it, but... The female roles that are in it are really well written. Yeah. I mean, the one thing that I always think about when it comes to shows like this, and I didn't re- like fully think about it until on New Year's Day, I watched both Mamma Mia and Mamma Mia Here We Go Again with my mother, um, because what else are you going to do during New Year's in quarantine? Right. And at one point she goes, oh, Julia, I I love this. I love this movie. And I was like, do tell. <laughs> and she was like, because you never get to see women over the age of 30 falling in love and being in relationships and exploring relationships. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that's why Mamma Mia is so good. We get to see Meryl Streep fall in love. It, that is a really underrepresented thing in the media. Um, and that was something that in Incognito, which is a play by Nick Payne that I was fortunate enough to direct um, like a year ago, a, a little over a year ago, mm-hmm. Um there's a whole character plot line about a woman in her fifties exploring love um, with a romantic partner of the same sex for the very first time. Um, and mm-hmm. it's just, it was so eye grabbing when I read the play for the first time um, because it's just something that you never see. Um, something that I yeah. think uh, Sarah rule does a really good job with in this play in particular as well of kind of having this woman explore a little bit about you know, just kind of being a a woman exploring her love life, you know, um, in not in her younger years, which is just an exciting thing to see represented through play. Yeah. What, what were your first experiences with, is this the first time you've read it? Yeah, this is my first time reading it. Um, I've absolutely no experience with it. Never seen it. First time reading it. I've read many, many a Sarah rule in my day though. <laughs> Read many, many plays by Sarah Rule. So I feel like I kind of understand her writing a little bit more um now. Um this play, in the way that it's written, kind of reminds me a little bit of um it's the scene that I did in scene study that has mm-hmm. it's like the, it's the scene with the orange. <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? Or the Oh, from, from um, Stephen, some yes. stars of Stephen. Something, yes. Sound, yes. Yeah. So, so, what is it called, Stephen? It's, it's um because it's based on um Werther. Yes. And, oh my God, is it the stars of Stephen? S- Sorrows of Stephen, yes, 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 yes. There are parts of it that remind me of Sorrows of Stephen because they're the two, um the, the he and she roles, the two uh, romantic leads on stage um are both Mm -hmm. their dialogue is just like hi hi how are you good you good like in in the second scene it reminds me a little bit of that so um that is something that sarah rule i feel like does quite a bit in her writing that i've gotten used to a little bit um after reading her plays more um but i must say that i anybody who knows me personally knows that i am a sucker for love like a sucker for love so um 
even though I have no experiences with this play, I feel like I, I've even just through reading it, um, especially towards the end of the play, I, I felt very, it felt very real and very special. I, the, the end of this play really takes you by surprise. Yes, it does. Because, yeah. because it, it starts off like your, your general romantic comedy a little bit. Like it's like, oh, these two, they get on each other's nerves, but secretly they have the hots for each other. And act one ends where like a rom-com would end. Right. But then we have act two. <laughs> exactly. Just like another another Into the Woods reference that we see here. <laughs> Let's see how many plays we can we can compare it to the woods. We can compare it to the woods. Um, and the interesting thing too is I was like, I'm like, oh, this is another play within a play show. Like we've done this twice. That now. was the first <laughs> my first note was that our theme so far is play within a play. Both the illusion and stage kiss are plays within the play. It's interesting, like, it's also plays that were relevant to me my freshman year. <laughs> it's just a mini theme for me as well. Like, it's like, oh, these were both, like, this has taken me back to 18-year-old Julia trying to figure herself <laughs> out. <laughs> I love that. I love um, that. I, like, I think I appreciate this more now that I am an adult. Um, and because I've worked with an intimacy director, because the thing that stuck out to me when I first started working because I my my intimacy director on Romeo and Juliet, like she had also done a lot of fight direction okay. and stuff. Or no, my director had done had done both, and she was like, "People always compare intimacy direction to stage direction, but they are not they are not really in the same league because you can fake punch someone every night on stage, eight nights a week, and your brain won't have a chemical reaction that's like, mm, I hate them now, right? But if you kiss someone eight nights a week, you your brain will literally have a chemical reaction right. because your brain does that. And the, the whole um, point of intimacy direction is making it so clinical that it dissuades your brain from doing that, essentially. Right, right. I was going to say, do you want to explain to maybe some of our unfamiliar listeners a little bit of like what an intimacy director is or what they do? So for those who don't know, an intimacy director, this is... A, a relatively new trend in theater is to hire an intimacy director. And their job is essentially to make sure that their actors are completely comfortable and consensual on stage. And a thing that a intimacy director will do is they'll take the actors aside. Everyone will go through where they are comfortable being touched and, um, you know, what is off limits. And it's all about visual and spoken cues and um visual and spoken consent so like if i were to say i'm comfortable with you touching my hand i would physically touch my hand and say i'm comfortable with having you touch my hand if i am uncomfortable with you touching my back i will not touch my back and say i'm uncomfortable with you touching my back and then the director will then explain to the intimacy director okay this is the type of action I want to happen here and the intimacy director will choreograph that in an actors in a way that is safe very nice that's a that was a great that was a great description that was a great description of it um yeah yeah, this show begs 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 for for an intimacy director I can't imagine doing the show without an intimacy director yeah I, I agree um there's too much uh kind of for for our listeners who haven't read it um, I mean, a lot of the dialogue between the woman who is kind of debating between her love of her husband and this this man that she had fallen in love with when she was younger, um, the the relationship between the two partners on stage is just very um, it's very sexualized in a way that is not um, made explicitly clear through the dialogue. Like they're not talking about sex. They're not really talking about any of that stuff, but just the way that they talk to each other is very aggressive, almost in the way of like, you know how they always say like sparks flying is a good thing, but too many sparks flying are going to cause a fire. And it's it's kind of a, a little bit like that where they are so passionate about each other that their passion kind of gets to an ag- aggressive level, not to the point of like, you know, being physically abusive or anything like that. They're just like very passionate <laughs> with each other. And the way yeah. that the dialogue is set up, I don't know how anybody would really be comfortable doing this play without an intimacy director. Um just mm-hmm. because it's so intimate. 
Yeah. And I, I feel like the stage directions in this too, like even something as simple as there was one part where he was like, he touches the tassel on her robe. Mm. Like that isn't by itself an inherently sexual act, but like just the fact that it's a tassel on the robe, it's something that could be undone. And like when he's talking about you, you looked really fetching in that costume and he like lightly touches her shoulder that in itself, like, even though it's something that's so simple and they've, you know, been kissing on stage, like, when it's those soft personal moments. Right. It's a completely different energy and a completely different boundary that he has crossed. Absolutely. And there was, there's another part in it, too, um, that he did, he said, a line that he had said, quote, hiding in a library seems kind of dry, end quote. Um, and he's talking about this kind of in reference of like where they should go um, to kind of like rendezvous. I think if I'm remembering correctly, it's something something along those lines. But nevertheless, the context of that line in the show is a very sexual nature to it, saying that the library is like not a place for sex. So we shouldn't go there. Yeah. And it's interesting, too, because, you know, in cast relationships and showmances are so mainstream that they have their own title. Yeah. Like we always hear about, oh, and these two actors, they fell in love on set. And it's like, okay, how much of that was because of a literal chemical reaction in their brain? Right. And because there weren't proper, um, you know, precautions and safety precautions taken. Right. And boundaries To make sure that they were warming up into a scene and cooling down and – like reaffirming consent every single time they perform. Yeah. Um, Yeah, absolutely. Something that I noticed from the play, it was second note that I took, just an audition 101 note. (laughs) And this kind of almost has nothing to do with the play itself, but um, just in the way that the main character of she is written, um, the character's name is just she, um, but she in the way that she's written um, is like this at the very beginning of it is a very anxious actor who like clearly has not done a lot of work in a long time, just wants to please the people in the room. Doesn't want to step on anybody's toes. Um, Just a note for anybody who's listening, who is an actor or is a performer, um, somebody who is auditioning for anything. Do not apologize for being in the room. You deserve to be there just (laughs) as much as the people behind the table. They should be honored that you have given up your time to be in their room to help produce their show. That was something that just kind of stuck out to me as being something I wanted to address here um, because it's a great character setup. It's it's an amazing character setup that Sarah Rule has done here with the role of she. Um, But definitely something that is not the way. I think a lot of the things that I realized while reading this is that Um, The way that she has portrayed theater and all of the things that go on in theater, such as the rehearsal room process and the audition process and stuff, is actually quite different from the way that it's actually run. Um, And I think she did that. She took that artistic liberty kind of, I'm assuming, for those reading the play who don't have theatrical experience. And and I think a good example here would be that um, as they're rehearsing for the play, uh, very frequently she will stop and ask a question. And believe it or not, that's actually not something that happens uh, quite so much anymore. Um, It does sometimes, but when it does, it's typically done in character and they'll just kind of ask the question in character so as not to, disrupt the rehearsal process. Um, And that is not what we see when it's being in the way that it's written here. And I think part of that is because somebody who doesn't know theater wouldn't know that that's the way that it's run. I think what we see here is the Mm -hmm. stereotypical version of like a rehearsal room process in what we're seeing. Um, And I think it does a, a great job with kind of connecting the audience who has done theater with the audience who hasn't done theater and having them have like a communal experience. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's something you have to consider whenever you're writing something. It's like, okay, how much am I going to adapt reality to fit a narrative structure? And in this case, I think like it works because they're not supposed to be like 
the most professional professional right company. like it's like <laughs> right and that's why we feel like we can produce this play in new haven right. <laughs> it's, it's a flop on broadway but i think we can do it justice here like I think new haven is the perfect place for it i think new haven is the perfect place um and because of that i think i think the director is a very brilliant character for a lot of reasons for for narrative purposes especially because you are immediately set up with um when she comes in she's like i'm sorry what is this about and he gives the the beautiful monologue about like well it's about (laughs) you know and he does it again in act two and that is such a good character solidifying Mm -hmm. moment um while also providing exposition while also you know giving more character development to our lead because she's just like oh right oh, oh okay wow that's that's so interesting like you right. know um and i think like the 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 nice thing about this play is it's not so detached from reality that it couldn't plausibly happen mm. and even though like even though like looking back at it it's like whoa they should really have an intimacy director and he was like you two figure it out on your lunch break <laughs> No, <laughs> no. Um, while it's written, you know, it's a more recent play. It feels like it's written about an older generation's version it, of doing it. It does. That makes any sense. Oh, it absolutely does. Because kind of to what I was referring to earlier in terms of like questions being asked in the rehearsal room and stuff like that. That doesn't happen quite so much today. But I remember when I first started doing theater, that very much did happen. Like that was very much yeah. a standard that was set back then that just doesn't happen now. Um, at least not as much and not in the theater that I've seen. Um, but it does feel in the way that it's written, like it's kind of, it almost feels like it's like the director and these two others in a room and they're just kind of like working their way through it. It almost feels like a community theater like production in yes. the way it's written. Yeah, I think it's less it's less that like, oh, this was written in the 90s like this takes place in the 90s and it's more that these actors when they did theater that was how they did it and i think like it's a nice dichotomy with with kevin right <laughs> because kevin's like well actually i'm not a registered fight director but i am an advanced actor combatant right. <laughs> kevin is the uh he's like the third little actor in the play and he just kind of plays like all these little side characters he's like a little intern um yeah and he's he I love Kevin he's great so much. when he was like oh yeah he was my student in meisner and he was just a star <laughs> you know another thing kind of going back to your director the point that you had about the director the other great part about the way that it's written is that it has so few details about like who the director is and the director's style and stuff and i put this down in my notes as well but in terms of like stage directions and specifically in scene two, the very beginning of scene two is just he and she, the two, you know, the couple um, of actors on stage kind of discussing like their past relationship without really discussing it. And there's like no stage directions for like three pages before the first stage direction comes up. And what I love about that, what I love, 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 love about that is that sometimes stage directions can kind of be a little bit restricting um, in terms of what you want to do versus what the playwright wants you to do. And again, for people who don't know what stage directions are, they're basically these like italicized um, directions telling you kind of like where to go, what to do, what to think, who they are, basically trying mm-hmm. to give you any insight that the playwright wants about how to do this show in the way that they envisioned it. Um, but obviously if they're saying, you know, she crosses downstage left and goes and sits on the the couch that's downstage left. I mean, what if you're doing it in a theater where you don't have a couch that's downstage left, so you can't follow the stage direction, you know? Um, So what Mm -hmm. I like about having no stage directions there for a little while is that it literally just lets the actors do whatever they're the most comfortable with in that that moment. Um, And that's how the entirety of the director character is written, is like all of his lines minus the monologues are just kind of like, what do you think? How do you feel about this? Why don't we try it? <laughs> like there's there's no yeah. substance to what he says. He just is like, yeah, let's do it. And then and then you know at the the very end of the play, like he just whooshes on in and and just kind of grabs you grabs you by the balls a little bit, you know. <laughs> yeah, 
I, I, I love to like, this is just, you know, smartly created in that, um, the husband plays the husband Mm. in the show, but also is she's husband in real life. And then the daughter is her daughter in real life. The character of Millicent is, um, he's girlfriend in real life. Like the first play within a play tells us exactly what's going to happen in the play play. Right. (laughs) That's a great line. (laughs) The play within the play is going to tell us what happens in the play play. (laughs) Julia Marie Black. (laughs) <laughs> and then the second play within a play was clearly you know written to mess with these characters right. um where she is literally playing a whore and he's literally playing a scumbag <laughs> like and it's just it's it's so it's so well crafted um it's it's so good and you know i had another moment here and i must say that when when i have this moment it always is immediate anger followed by immediate gratitude <laughs> and, <laughs> and stuff. But I, you know, in this play, I when I was reading it, especially the first play within the play, I was reading it and I said, is it just me or is this like bad? <laughs> like yeah. as I was reading the play within the play, I was like, I don't think that this dialogue is good like it doesn't sound good (laughs) and then i was like but i but sarah rules like so good so i'm confused and then later on they address it they address it head on and she's like this dialogue is like bad and and he is like yeah "Yeah, it's not great um and (laughs) and it reminded me of a moment that i had when i was watching gypsy um, with Imelda Staunton, mm-hmm. I was watching Gypsy, and she goes the whole, the whole, like, it's like three hours long, and, you know, by hour, like, two, all she's done is scream. She just, like, yells all of her lines. You did not like this version I didn't. She, 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 <laughs> she yelled, like, <laughs> all of her lines for, for, like, absolutely no reason, and it wasn't until, like, two hours into the play that they were, they, like, addressed it, and they were like, why are you yelling? <laughs> All you've been doing is yelling. And so for me, it comes in its immediate anger at the fact that I just spent all that time thinking about like how the dialogue was written badly or about how Imelda Staunton is yelling all the time. And then I'm filled <laughs> with immediate gratitude at the fact that these people are so smart in the way that they're because they right. Because they're do and they're doing it on purpose. Like they're really doing it to like kind of try to mess with you. Um and it's mm-hmm. something that if it's written well, you don't see coming. And then and then it it hits you and you like I just immediately am like just want to get on my knees and just bow down to Sarah Rule. <laughs> you know? There's there's nothing like literally the first one of the first exercises I did when I when I started um taking playwriting classes was you know, our teacher was like, write a bad scene. Write a horrible scene with bad dialogue. <laughs> It's really hard to do. I know. It's yeah, it's hard it's in the like, same way like, that it's hard to ask like a singer to sing something bad. Because I mean, like it's <laughs> like throwing in, you know, unnecessary exposition and saying no to everything. <laughs> like, <laughs> like the opposite of yes ending. Right. It's just saying no, because this is actually true. Don't you know, Carlisle? <laughs> like, <laughs> right. Using everybody's names too much. And it, it's it's really difficult to do. And I I applaud that it's it's bad enough that you st- that it really starts to irk you mm-hmm. after right. a couple minutes because you're like, why would why would anyone why would why would you say that? Right. <laughs> you taste like darling, like cherries? No, chestnuts. Right. <laughs> 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 yeah yeah the, and, and that's how i felt when i watched gypsy too because like i let's now a queen is a queen melda santon is a queen like a queen is a queen, <laughs> a queen, is a queen. We, we, we love her we love her love her love her but just to your point like you said i mean it's hard to write like either bad thing or make a choice that as an actor you're like oh god like this is just i'm gonna repeat the same choice over and over and over again like for the bit basically um and to like stick with that is like a really hard thing to do um so yeah i mean props to sarah rule for sure yeah Um, and it it got even worse with the second play within a play yeah yes it did in the best possible because at first like when when I, i remember seeing it on stage and thinking 
wow, the director wrote, like, the director wrote this. <laughs> <laughs> like, the, the director didn't have any developmental readings. Like, this is the developmental reading. <laughs> <laughs> and then when you find out what's actually been going on, that the husband paid him to do this. Right. It's like, oh, this director is a genius. <laughs> Yeah, man, that directing that director character is just <laughs> the director and Kevin are really the the backbone. <laughs> they are. Yeah, they really are. They keep they keep things light for you. Um, uh, let's see. I said here just a, a a line that I I absolutely loved. Just a line that really stuck out to me that I just had to take a second. I was like, ooh. Um, the, the, he, he is talking to she and he says, um, no darling, but it was heaven being miserable with you. Oh no. Yeah, man. That line really got me. Um, oh, I did. I, I wrote down one too, yes, because I, I had a feeling you were going to write down your favorite. Um, I wrote down, uh, he comforts me like a hot cup of tea. No, more like a person. <laughs> Another great line. She's definitely great- Sarah Rule ha- fills in some some really good um, jokes as well in here. And one of the jokes that that got me that got me good really had me killed over laughing. Um, is a fun fact for the people who are listening um, that everybody in my life has heard me say a thousand times, but. I am the daughter of a doctor and a nurse, and I'm the sister of two doctors and a nurse. Um, so out of the five, out of the six of us, I am the the only one that is not in medicine. But my entire life growing up, medicine has been a medicine doctor, the human body, health, all of that has been a common theme in my life. And there's a joke oh, no. in the show. But I love it. There's a joke in the show. <laughs> Where they're talking, they mess up the words oxy, uh, oxytocin and oxycodone. <laughs> and oxytocin is the love hormone. And that is like the, you know, hormone that's released, especially in like childbirth and things like that. It helps relax, f- particularly women and stuff. Um, and oxy- oxycotton is a painkiller. <laughs> Like they're too drastically, <laughs> like a really high, high dosage painkiller, and so um, they they are talking about oxyco- uh, oxytocin, and they're talking about love and all this stuff about oxytocin, and she's basically, you know, he he says something like, "Well, I'm afraid that she can't go home. It wasn't the oxycodone," and everybody's like, "No, no, no, <laughs> the the oxytocin, oxytocin." So it just it, it's just a great. It's you know, she's got some great little bits in there. Um, I do have one question for you, Julia. Um, yeah, hit me with it. So there's a reference at the beginning of the play um, that she is doing some sort of strange gesture. Um, and all it keeps referring to in the play is like a strange gesture. Strange gesture. Like she does a strange gesture. Um, and I was just kind of wondering, in your opinion, what you would want that s- strange gesture to be. Oh, she makes a strange gesture substituting for a kiss. Okay, what I would oh, do. Oh, yeah, so it's a strange gesture, like substituting for a kiss, basically, because they're oh, uncomfortable would, doing it I on would, stage. I would take my hands in um, crab hands and I would, you know, smush them together to look like two, two hands making out. That's what I would do. <laughs> Uh, um, I think I think in the version I saw, she did like a version of that. Yeah. She did like two hands making out, or like a, you know. I love that. Um, that feels right. That feels good. I was like going over my I, head I've trying to figure it before. out. It for me, I feel like my the the type of humor that I always think is the funniest is when something's like just a little bit off, like just the tiniest bit wrong. Um, you know, like mm-hmm. playing playing a musical instrument, but playing like a couple notes wrong, <laughs> but the rest of it being right, like things like that, I always think are hilarious. So for me, I feel like mm-hmm. I want that special, that like whatever, that weird, awkward gesture to be referencing like a different sense, like like maybe like a smell <laughs> or like hearing. <laughs> 
like something that's just like a little bit <laughs> off instead of physical touch, you know, as being like a, the sense. Maybe, yeah, like maybe like smelling the air or like putting your hand up to like your ear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like something that's just like the littlest bit off. Like people don't know why it's happening. Um, but I was curious to know what you thought. I'm, I'm very happy with with your answer little crab Thank hands it'd be even out. better if they were not crab hands and it said llama hands that were like- <laughs> llama hands i love it llama hands um okay our audience can't see this right now but we'll post pictures of ourselves <laughs> on the instagram doing our strange gestures yes, for you perfect um so julia do you have any design ideas the difficult part about that is i saw a really good set design of this mm. and it is very comfy in my head mm. um I, I feel like the first scene has to be empty stage with a chair. Like, there's no other way right. to do that audition scene that would feel quite as lovely and awkward of having all that space and one chair. <laughs> because that's what that's what most audition rooms are like. You come in and maybe there's a chair there and maybe there's an X on the floor. Right. Yes. Because I think when when I saw it, the, the set designer who did this was brilliant. Um, and for the first play within a play, it was just they had... I believe like rolling set pieces that kind of like how you would do for a a big budget musical where there's not necessarily like a fully enclosed set, but there's pieces that move in and out Mm -hmm. as needed. Right. And then the apartment set was so elaborate and, and fantastic. Like it, it was like a kitchenette and there was a a really crappy bed there. Like it was, Katie was beautiful. It was chef's kiss. Oh, I love it. And then they could just kept the same set for the other show because they say it's an ear- <laughs> right. eerily, like, identical <laughs> Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, but I, I just remember b- being astonished because it started so simple so that by the time the apartment set was there and fully realized, it was kind of shocking. And it was at the beginning of Act 2, too, so they had time to set up the stage while we were all at intermission. Right, right. Um, but especially in the theater that I saw it in, it was a very small theater, Um I feel like it would be hard to do this show in a big theater. Oh, I would never want to see this in a presidio. Yeah, like, like I feel like it ha- it's I don't too even the, want to see it. the way it's written is too intimate to in my opinion. Yeah. The subtext is so subtle. Right. And like the the touching the tassel. I'm all, I'm going to keep on going back to the touching of the tassel because it's a fantastic stage direction. I love it. Um <laughs> And just especially when you have the moment with the two of them, I'm pretty sure in the production I saw, they were just kind of like sitting on the stage next to each other, just kind of like, oh, wasn't that so crazy what we just did? Mm. And that moment was so perfect because it was just the two of them sitting on stage. Right. Yeah. And it leaves you with that question, like, oh, this this should be the end, but it's Mm. not. What's going to happen next? Right. Oh, I love. Chaos ensues. (laughs) Chaos does ensue. Um, And I'm pretty sure they ended it similarly with the husband too when they have their recon it was like the two of them sitting on stage together and it was just a very yeah it was very sweet because the husband is a very difficult role to play Mm -hmm. because you spend the entire show getting to know he i'm gonna call him johnny because he ends up playing johnny twice um you end up getting to know he and you get to follow along on that love story. And then the husband comes out of the woodwork at the end and you don't have the same emotional attachment to him as an audience member. Right. So he has to really sell that he's a- the actual actual man. Right. Of right. Her, like the actual leading man. Right. Or not leading man, but husband. Heroic yeah. interest. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I never really thought about that. But that role does definitely pose some challenges for the actor of trying to figure out how to in, in a beautifully challenging way, um, like definitely a challenge. I, I would love to explore like as an actor, as a character study, I would love to see a production of that and just solely look at the, the father, the husband, I'm sorry. Right. Take a look at him. And- I, I have a good dream cast idea for him, which oh, I'll tell you about yes, later. Let's hear it. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but I want to hear your concept ideas. Yeah. I think, you know, my first thing that I have here is just gender blind casting, period. Wow. Um, you know, I think I would l- I would like because I've had no experience with the show. I think for me, I would like to see it written exactly as is. Um, at first, I think that I would like that to be my first experience with it, but I would also love to see this role just just this whole show gender blind casting. Like I just think 
there are so many dynamic shifts that could happen, you know, if it was two men on stage or two women on stage or uh, somebody who's transgender on stage. Like, I just think it, it adds a lot more deeper elements to it that I would love to see. Kevin could be anyone. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Kevin. Oh, Kevin is just the human embodiment that. of like a golden retriever. Um, yeah. I, I, I love the idea of having a female director as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Normally, I've only seen it done with a man. Yeah. But. I think I think first and foremost, the thing that I would want to see is she played by anybody who is an unstereotypically commercialized theatrical actor. So, like, I want to see somebody who's, like, not white, somebody who's not cis, somebody who's not conventionally beautiful – some something that defies the standards of specifically what theater puts on people. And Julie and I talk about this quite a bit um, in terms of like our types, because as an actor, Julia is really tall. I'm really short. Um, so naturally, like there are boxes that you're just going to fit in um, as opposed to others. And um, I would just love to see that conventional standard broken in any way. I just think sp yeah. specifically for that character, I really want to see that. I think the biggest element for me that I would love to see on, on stage here would be um, uh, sound. I would love, love, love to just have background noise like a good amount of the time. You know, like when the actors are on a break, maybe hearing like a water bottle dropping on the ground or like chatter or like a piano messing around in the background like things like that to set the environment since it frequently shifts between the rehearsal room and then like the rehearsal room when they're not rehearsing so i think yeah i would like to see i think sound could play a really big part in differentiating that um without the need for something like extravagant lighting or extravagant costumes um and i think that's pretty much all that i have um, for, for kind of concepts, obviously the fight scene that, that he and she go through, um, the more sexual, the better, but obviously not to the point where either of them are incapable of either delivering their lines or being comfortable with each other. But I think that that there's a fight scene in the, the show. It's not really a fight, but, um, this small little kind of conflict that they get into. Um, and obviously mm -hmm. I think that the more uncomfortable the audience can be in that situation is almost kind of the better. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for what, sure. Um, what are some of your, your casting choices here? So for the husband, just a slam dunk, can't go wrong, Paul Rudd. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because Paul Rudd could do literally anything and still be endearing. <laughs> um, another one I would love is like Mark Ruffalo. Like, mm -hmm. Hollywood boyfriends right. <laughs> would would be really great um, for that role in particular. Mm. And then for she, one that popped into my head that's a little like less traditional would be Tony Collette. I don't know Tony Collette. Just because she, oh, Katie, look her up. You'll love okay. her. Um, she's, she's been in a lot of horror stuff recently. She was the mom in Little Miss Sunshine. And she was just, what was she? She was just recently in Knives Out. She was fantastic in Knives okay. Out. Okay. Um, and she's been, she's been a lot of horror recently. That's mm. just been off the wall good. Um, and the reason I say she'd be a little more untraditional, she's generally a character actress. And I think like she, she would just play this part so well. Mm. And then, um, I also think I've been trying to get you to watch Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. I know. Um, but the woman who plays Paul in Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, Donalyn Champlain, I think she would be so so good um she's she's so insanely talented and then as i was thinking that she would be good there's a whole subplot where her character like meets a client and they fall in love but she's like oh but i'm married so Ooh. we can't do this <laughs> they're they're quite the duo um i'll send you the episode so you can watch because i think if you saw the two of them together you'd be like oh i see what she's talking about oh perfect oh um, i love that and then another one that i think would be really like in the same realm as as this guy would be Norm Lewis. Yes, yeah. Um, like you can't help but like Norm Lewis. You know what right, I mean? Right, right. And I think he can even like he can play those roles that are more problematic. Like I don't know the Phantom. <laughs> and, 
mm. and <laughs> still guess. be charming and you get why people are into him. Right, you know what I right. mean? Yeah. But yeah, those were the those were the major ones. Very <laughs> nice. I, I've been I've been um marinating in my thoughts um as we've been talking mm-hmm. and I think some of my casting would be the first one that comes to mind just feels perfect for me um is Topher Grace as the director um Topher Grace oh plays <laughs> um plays Eric in that 70s show um Topher Grace as the director as this like very bland but also very characteristic and loving director I really think he could do a great job with that Oh my god, Katie, I love that. <laughs> it's so good. Um, I would love um he's a little old, but it's a dream casting as Kevin Christopher Fitzgerald. So he, the character of he, I would also it's a, it's a little weird, but bear with me here is Alex Brightman. And the reason being is because Alex Brightman um is a really good stage character actor. Um, Dewey Finn in School of Rock, Beetlejuice and Beetlejuice, like great character actor. But I feel like, I don't know why, I can just see him playing like the dentist in Little Shop of Horrors. And I feel like the dentist in Little Shop of Horrors has big like he vibes in in this show in terms of, yeah. you know, kind of being this like um, mysterious man that you're like attracted to and you don't really know why. And I feel like I feel like Alex Brightman has that side of him that he could flip on um, and use his character acting like in that to really do a really good job with it. It's something I would like to see. I'd be interested to see. Yeah. I feel like him and and maybe like Stephanie J. Block together oh, would just yes. be like a real power yes, duo. I, would. I also, I don't know where um, she would. I can also see him as the director too. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. I could see him as the director. Um, I also don't know why, but Sandra Bullock comes up in my head as that makes being sense. in this play yeah. somehow, and I don't know why, but her energy also feels very fitting for uh, yeah. this show. I feel like her character and Miss Congeniality like just just fits with this character yeah. a lot in terms of energy. I agree. Yeah, I, there's so many talented middle aged women that just there aren't enough roles that aren't moms, I and I mean. Is a mom, but that's not like her sole function, right? Right. You know? oh, oh, I just thought of one, Laura Dern. Oh Laura Dern. my god, yes. Oh my god, what a good one. Yeah. Oh, I just thought of one more. Oh, one let's, more. Let's, let's hear and it. I'll be done. I promise. Mark Hamill as the husband. Mark Hamill. I don't know who that is. Luke Skywalker. Oh, I've never seen Star Wars. Why, Katie? Why? I have so many reasons as to why. Um. And I'll really quickly, reason number one, I've seen parts of it. I have not seen any movie fully, but I've seen parts of almost every single one. I can appreciate the history that it made at the time, especially in terms of graphic design and uh, animation. Um, I can also appreciate Mm -hmm. that the plot line and the characters were very, very advanced for the time. But I just, I've watched parts of it. I just really don't like sci-fi. Like, if I'm being honest, that just really is what it comes down to is that I just can't, I get so bored because they're all the same to me. (laughs) Like, they just Mm -hmm. all, like, are so similar that I just can't get through it. It just, like, bores the crap out of me, you know? I'm sorry to disappoint. I'm it. sorry. At least follow Mark Hamill on Twitter. Okay. He's really funny on Twitter. Uh, you know I'm a sucker and for, for he also Twitter. He's so. the voice of the animated Joker. Okay. So he's he's a very talented, wonderful man. Well stay tuned. Maybe Julia will convince me. Um I don't I don't maybe. think that that will be the case, but maybe. All right, then, uh, Julia, why don't we talk about our calls to action? I would like to ask you what you are learned from this play and how you were going to use what you learned and put it back into the world in a positive way. The biggest thing for me is hire intimacy directors. There is no excuse not to. People will say, oh, we don't have the budget. Find the budget, make it happen. That's because right. That's right. It's. It's actors' bodies and actors' well-being that is at stake when you do not hire an intimacy director. And I'd say my other call to action, 
kind of kind of bouncing off of that is um don't fall into the trap of thinking that spontaneity and excitement are the same thing as love. Like I I don't know what this quote comes from, but I it, I like it. Qu- love is a quiet room at the end of the day. Someone someone can email us and tell us who said that. <laughs> I, I don't think it was me. I don't think it was a Julie Black <laughs> original. Um, but I I think there is something beautiful about looking at someone who, you know, loves you for all of the things that you are instead of critiques you for all the things that you are not. And I think the, the be- most beautiful part of this love story for me, our professor once said to me, because I was I was going through a time and I was like, how do you make a relationship work between two artists? Because it's very hard to do. And she said, never be with someone who makes you feel bad about doing the things that you love. And it took me way too long to learn that lesson. And I think like the most beautiful moment in this is when the husband says, I want you to, you know, take me into a theater once a month and I will play whatever role you want me to play. And I think, like, there's something so beautiful about him, like, even though he maybe took the wrong way to get that point right. across by Casby going to play as a whore. Um, he said, where can we meet in the middle? Because I don't want you to have to stop doing what you love. And for me, that like, that is love compromise is, is love is compromise and it's saying this is what you are and this is what you bring to the table and even if it's something i don't understand i love that you love it that was beautiful julia thank you it's just my little <laughs> valentine's day thought yeah the- yeah yeah it's such a love is such a hard thing you know um yeah. But but I, I completely agree. I think that love looks different for everybody, but the way that it is illustrated in this play can really just get you right down to your core, you know, and kind of figuring out what love means to you. What do you think? Um, I have I have two calls to action. Um, my first call to action is that, as I kind of said earlier, I briefly mentioned, I've had a couple of experiences directing. But first and foremost, above that, I'm a teacher. And um, and so as I kind of get older and continue to pursue my education to get my master's degree, to get my doctorate, to teach college, um, to be an acting professor, um, directing is something that is a part of that job. Um, and it's something that for people who have don't really know how college in a, or a theater in a college or university works, um, typically – your uh, teachers are also your directors with um, the occasional guest director that gets brought in. You know, directing is something that I'm probably going to be doing for for quite some time in my life. Um, And so my call to action here is to really, really, really try um, to fight to cast people, avoiding the stereotypes that we typically see within theater. Um, Avoiding these stereotypes as much as I possibly can. Um, and trying to continue to make audiences uncomfortable in the ways that I choose to break that barrier. Um, so whether that means, you know, addressing the issues right in the face, um, casting based on everything except for looks, um, you know, some one of the things that I really tried to do in my directing experiences thus far has been to cast people in roles that I felt like they could learn from um, since my, my directorial mm-hmm. experience has been in a collegiate setting. Um, I think that that's something that we still, we are a very um, product focused industry and it shouldn't be about the product. Um, And it is, obviously, that's what makes the money. That's what keeps the business running. That's what keeps the economy running, whatever. That's not what theater is about. It's not what it should ever be about, ever. And the second that I start treating theater like a money-making business and I stop treating theater like the educational, communal, empathy building experience, life changing experience that it can be. That's the day that I want people to tell me that I got to get out, um, because I don't want to see a world in which I am putting that kind of energy into my passion. 
Um, I want my passion to remain being a learning experience and being something that we can all grow from and experiences we can talk about. My second call to action is very similar to yours, Julia. It's just that what I, even what I said earlier, you know, I'm a sucker for love. Anybody who knows me knows that. Um, I love love songs. It's my favorite type of music. Um, I love hearing about love stories. I love watching my friends fall in love. I love helping my friends. I love watching, you know, uh, older people who have been married forever continue to show their love. I love watching new relationships bloom. I love the love between friendships. I love the love that we see between pets and humans. I mean, I love all kinds of love. Um, But nevertheless, and especially in the crazy start of 2021 that um, we've seen here in the U.S., um, we can love more. So my call to action is to love more. Love everything. Love everyone. Love the people who hate me and ask for forgiveness from the people that I've hurt. Give love back. Take the love and give the love. And just filling your heart to the absolute max with all of the love that you can possibly have. Because I just, I don't see how literally anything is more important than that. <laughs> and that's my own personal yeah. belief. That's mine, you know, and and everybody, I know lots of people who don't think that's the case. And that's, t- that's your own, your own thoughts on it. But for me, I just, I don't care. Money isn't real. <laughs> It's paper. <laughs> you know, jobs aren't real. It's something that we keep ourselves occupied with while we're on earth. All of these things, these materialistic things or, you know, how mu- the legacy that you're going to leave behind and stuff, as long as it's filled with love, I don't care. Um, and so I think that uh, for me is just kind of giving more love and taking more love. And that means loving myself more and uh, mm-hmm. loving my experiences more and loving my family more and you get the gist of it. Loving everything more. Yeah. Yeah. My my two favorite Katieisms are that that you brought to my attention. Um number one is that I've started to notice songs that say I love you without saying I love you. Those are the best um, ones. That's a key. <laughs> I'm gonna make a playlist of it. I will share it with you. Oh, um, yeah. And then my second Katieism that we actually talked about pretty recently. We talked about it at the beginning of the pandemic. You were like, I don't care how much money I spend on gifts. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, money money does not matter. And it, it's changed the way that I buy gifts for people. And the way, like, I'll just be like, hey, do you want me to pick you up coffee while I'm... Because, what's it? Two, Three dollars. Right, you know? right. Well, that's and something that I've like, been I, I've, I've been very fortunate that my parents have have taught me growing up, and I really can't give any credit to anybody besides them for really teaching me that lesson at such a young age and talking about how like you know if you, you know Christmas happens once a year, go go nuts, yeah. or you know like your friends having a bad day, do something for them, and sometimes the only thing you really can do is give them materialistic objects. So who cares? Money's going to come back. Yeah. You're going to make it again next week. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's definitely like made me start to notice not only the way I give gifts, but the way people in my life give gifts. Because like everyone's got a different love language. Everyone right. has a different way of communicating. You know, my mom will say I love you a million times a day. And she'll be like, I've ever told you that I love you. And I'm like, yes, you have. <laughs> you know, That's and so then cute. my dad anticipates people's needs. So like every time I would come home from college, I'd find like my favorite five dollar cookies from Aldi's, like in the pantry, Aww. and he only does that when I come home. Oh, that's so sweet. Um, and like just and like me and my brother, we can go months without talking to each other, but the the relationship never changes. Like I'll send him a meme, and he'll right. be like, "I miss you." Right. <laughs> and yeah, I think identifying your love languages with people. Because once you notice it, like, not only does it create a stronger bond with that person, but it fills you up. Yeah. Like, when you notice the way that people spread love to you and show love to you, like, nothing fills you up quite like that. No, because they know they are doing it, you know, hopefully to also co- communicate with your love language in a way that you can understand. Um and that's so beautiful that somebody like takes the time to think about that. And honestly, isn't that what Valentine's Day is all about? 
is it see we circle if back being real here <laughs> isn't that what it's all about isn't it just about like showing each other that you love them <laughs> um okay cool well want to tell everybody what we're going to be talking about next week or two weeks from now yes next week is so well our next our next play date we will be having broadway actor director playwright ashley griffin joining us That's very exciting and we will be reading, I, it's so exciting and we'll be reading her play snow um words can't describe it's, it's how excited so i good, am y'all. for our next play date it's so exciting she's literally the coolest person <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna have a really really good time so yeah send us your thoughts ideas follow us on instagram do all the stuff yeah yeah um as always if you have any comments about anything that we've talked about today any ideas that you have any thoughts on sarah rule or stage kiss or any other play that she's done or play date um anything like that feel free to shoot us an email at podcastplaydate at gmail.com thanks for joining us for this week's play date You can follow us on Instagram at playdate.podcast for updates, giveaways, and more fun stuff. Our cover art was designed by the amazingly talented Haley Denton Hughes. And our theme music was composed and recorded by Mickey Wadsworth. I'm Kate. And I'm Julia. Keep playing.